This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalbethanchel. Later this year, on September 1st, the day will mark 80 years since Germany invaded Poland. The Nazi occupation led to the start of World War II. How should young people learn about the Holocaust and genocide? Coming up, we'll talk about a new Connecticut law that requires public schools to teach students about the Holocaust. First, history is often best remembered when hearing from the people who have witnessed historic events. People like Rabbi Philip Lazowski, a Holocaust survivor who fled his home in 1942. He's lived in Connecticut for more than 63 years. A longtime faith leader in the greater Hartford community, Rabbi Lazowski has spoken often about his experience escaping the Nazis. He joins us in studio to talk about his story. Do you have a family member who survived the Holocaust? You can join us too. The number 860-275-7266. And you can find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. I want to welcome Rabbi Philip Lazowski uh, into our studio. Thank you so much for coming in today. Thank you. I should mention that you are Rabbi Emeritus of Beth Hillel Synagogue in Bloomfield, also Emmanuel Synagogue in West Hartford, and chaplain to the State Senate, the Hartford Hospital, and the Hartford Police Department. And you have written several books, including your autobiography called Faith and Destiny. So tell our listeners about the place you grew up. Well, the place that I grew up was called Bielitsa, which is not far away from a better known uh, bigger city. It's called um, Vilna or Vilnus or Lida. And there where I was 11 years old and my story is a lesson to show how the Nazis brutalized, murdered, and oppressed the civilization, Mm -hmm. and the world stood by and did not care. Rabbi, before you talk about that time where you had to escape your home, can you tell us about what life was like before Germany invaded Poland? What was uh, your family like? Mm -hmm. Uh, And a little bit about the house that you grew up in. What kind of childhood did you have? I had a wonderful childhood. We had four boys and one girl. I am the oldest of the family. Um, My mother, of blessed memory, uh, she was in business, and so my father was a fisherman also in business. And when the war started, I was... 11 years old. Uh, when uh, you think about back and where you grew up uh, in Belitsa, so at that point, uh, was your town first occupied by the Soviets? And uh, what did you know about what was happening? Well, we knew very little what's happening. The reason is, uh, first and foremost, Belitsa was an agricultural uh, town mostly from the farmers. And um, till 1939, we lived under the Poland. In 1939, Poland was divided among Germany and Russia. Our part was Russia. Well, when the Russian came in, we were considered a bourgeoisie, which means if somebody in business, like my mother or father, they sent to Siberia. Mm. So every night we were waiting to come, the Russians send us to Siberia. Mm. I recall my mother used to prepare two big uh, uh, sacks of dry bread because five kids, in order to go by train for months, we wouldn't have, we would starve. So, but fortunately, the people liked us so much that some of the workers spoke up for us and said they are very good people. And 
we will not send out to Siberia. So my father got a job working for the Russians, and he made sure he came on time, because if he doesn't come on time, they put you to jail. So I recall this incident. And then in two years, we wanted the Russians. The Russian spoke to us that Stalin is God, which uh, we were not allowed to uh, to wear certain things, and uh, especially when you go to school, every child was a pioneer, used to wear a red a scarf, but not us because we were considered an outsider. So, but it didn't take long. In 1941, the Germans came to our town, and our town, even though it was not very prominent, it was right next to our airport where the Russians were learning how to fly. And when they heard that the Germans came, they started to fight with the Germans. The Germans, three Germans were killed. So the Germans decided to burn the whole town. Mm. So, uh, You're hearing from uh, Rabbi uh, Philip Lazowski, who is a longtime faith leader here uh, in Connecticut. He's also a Holocaust survivor, as we talk a little bit about his personal story. You can join us, too, uh, later in the show, the number 860-275-7266. So when the Nazis uh, came into your village, um, you write in your book, Faith and Destiny, uh, you were young, and so you were spared some of the abuse that they uh, put towards other Jews. What happened to them? Well, it was unbelievable. It was the the people start running from their homes, and the Germans used looked for for the Russians. Anybody that was, did not have hair was considered a soldier. My father was bold, therefore he. They wanted to shoot him, so he grabbed the hold of our little baby to show that he's not a soldier, that he is a, a husband of a, of a wife and a family. Mm -hmm. So they threw us out from the house, and we left the house just like we are standing in one jacket, one little coat, and we couldn't take anything with us. Everybody helped the other kids mother used to carry the little baby, mm -hmm. father used to carry the other children, and I used to hold on to the hand of, of the bigger boys. So you had to leave uh, your home in Belitsa, and your family ended up moving to uh, a place called Jato? No, not yet. Mm -hmm. You see, we were in Belitsa for another three months mm -hmm. because we didn't have a place where to stay, so we stayed with our grandfather's house. In the meantime, the Nazis came, and they started to beat us up and to demand everything from gold, from silver, from pictures, which we didn't have. So they took people, and they said, if we don't give enough of this gold, we'll shoot them. All the ladies gave up all their jewelry, etc. In the meantime, they shoot all the people. Mm -hmm. So, and then they forced us to go to ghetto in Jettel. Mm -hmm. In Jettel, they put us in one room, all seven of us, five children, mother and father. We slept on the floor, very few uh, rations, food, and fortunately we knew so many good Christians that were friends of ours, they used to bring us some food. And that's why we were able to survive for a number of months in the ghetto. 
And lo and behold, the Christian friends came to us and said, you know, all the other ghettos are being murdered, and you better do something in the ghetto. So we, we, in the house that we're living was unfinished. Only a roof was sticking out, and it was a lot of lumber and so on. So we decided to build a hiding place. And in the hiding place, all of us went in when the massacre started. Mm. Unfortunately, I was the one who had to close the entrance not to be noticed. And I told the family, I will hide someplace else. As soon as I closed the entrance, a Nazi spotted me and asked me, where's your family? He said, my family went already to the marketplace. What are you doing here? I said, I forgot my coat. And he said, where you go, you don't need a coat. And I said, if you don't run, I'll shoot you right now. So I came to the marketplace, and in the marketplace, I saw a picture which is indescribable. What was happening there? Words cannot describe the brutality and the acts that they performed. I saw a woman breasting a child, and the Nazi came with the bayonet and burst the baby and threw it like a football. I saw people uh, standing there for no reason. They shoot him on the spot. They were drunk or something to this effect, but the the acts was so unbelievable. And then I realize what they do. Uh, there is a Nazi that was standing in the yellow uh, clothes, and with his finger he used to point right and left. And I saw, I noticed that um, the elderly and the children were always sent one side, but the young people that are able to work were sent to the other side, and especially whoever had a certificate, like a doctor, a nurse, a tailor, a cobbler, etc., they let go. So I figured that uh, I will go to die. Anyway, I'm so glad that my family is not here. I used to go around and look for the family. And then in my mind came in, maybe I will ask somebody to take me as a son. So I went over to a few people and said, we have our own, which... And then I saw that the people getting less and less, and a lady was standing with two daughters. Uh, one was five and one was seven, and the lady had a certificate that she's a nurse. So I went on up to her and I said, I don't have anybody here. Would you take me as your son? She looked at me and she said, listen, if they let me live with two children, let hold on to my dress. As a matter of fact, I was wearing the yellow sign, the sixth star of David, and it was crooked because from pushing, they ripped it part of it. So she said to me, if a German is going to see you like this, they're going to shoot you right now. So she had a pen in her, in her pocket, and she pinned my, my yellow uh, uh, sign. Mm. So she helped save your life. And she, she went over t- to, the, to the guy with the finger and um, to the Nazi, and uh, she showed the certificate. She's a nurse. And she also said, my husband is also over there on the other side because her husband was strong and big and tall. So that's how she saved my life. So after that, you ran back to 
uh, the home that you were staying in, and you right. were reunited with your mother and siblings? Right. After I went there, unfortunately, I saw six people in front of the house lying dead. So I figured that my family, I fainted. But my aunt knew where the cave was. She opened the cave and said, where is my son, meaning me? She said, I didn't see your son. My, mo- my mother went to look, and she came out from the house. I was lying there. Uh, fainted, and that's the first time I saw my mother. Mm. Again, I'm speaking with Rabbi Philip Lazowski, who's a Holocaust survivor, a longtime faith leader here in the greater Hartford community, as we hear about uh, how he escaped uh, the Nazis and and went on to live uh, in Connecticut for many, many years here on Where We Live. Uh, We're talking with him for the full hour, and you can join us too. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Uh, How long were you able to be reunited with your family before uh, there was an incident where uh, many of the Jewish residents were uh, sent to a movie theater. What happened there, Rabbi? In two months, two and a half months, there was Yudin rain. Yudin rain means no one is left alive. Everybody has to be killed. So we went again in the cave. This time I was with the family in cave for six days and six nights. Then they found the cave. So mother said to us, this is the end. Since then, try to save yourself if you can. In the meantime, the German went into the house to look again for jewelry for this. But while he went in there, mother said, run. Now is the time to run. One German saw my other brother run, shoot him in the back. My other brother went into the outhouse, and I went under a bush, and I was watching what they're doing. They took my mother and two little siblings, and they took them away. And I was waiting till they took them away. I went to look for my father, but a dog spotted me, and the dog started to bark. A Nazi spotted, heard the dog barking. He came out and he saw me. He said, what is your name? And I told him, my name is Lazowski. And he gave me such a a slap in the face that I fell down on the floor. Says, you're lying, you're a Jew. I said, yes, I am a Jew, but I am, my name is Lazowski. He took me into the movie house, and in the movie house, I found my mother and the two little children, the lower, the smallest of the family, one girl and one boy. The girl was five, and the boy was six. At that point when uh, you saw your mother and and two siblings, uh, what happened? What did your mother say to you? Well, she embraced me and hugged me, and she said, I'm glad that you are alive. What happened to the others? I said, I don't know. But she she knew that one was killed while we were outside in the back. So we waited there two days, maybe... My father would find out that we are there and come to take us, but take us out from the movie. But it didn't take long, and the trucks again showed up, and we were on the second floor, and the window was locked. She took a chair, and she broke the window, and she said, you have to jump from the second floor. I said, I'm not jumping without you. And she said, I want you to jump to tell the world what was going on. I want you to survive, and I want you to be somebody. These three words. And she pushed me out of the window. Mm. When she pushed me out of the window, another mother saw that what she did, she took her son 
which was nine years old. I was at that time 11. And she pushed him out on the window too. And this boy was lying next to me. We waited for 15, 20 minutes. They packed in all the, the people and they took him to be slaughtered, to be shoot. So you ended up, uh, when that happened, uh, did you know at the time that you wouldn't see your mother again and your, your other two siblings? Yes, I knew that because I saw what they're ready to do. And uh, they show, I, the experience I saw in the marketplace, so I know exactly what is going to transpire. Mm. Remind us how old you were at the time, Rabbi. I was 11. 11. 11 years old, and then the kid was nine. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, come with me. So he went with me back in the ghetto because I didn't know where to go. And in the ghetto, I saw a man carrying a big uh, chair, piece of furniture, something like that, which I said to him, can I help you? And I started a conversation. And I said to him, no more juice here, huh, Ra? Oh, yes, they finished all the juice here. Are there any juice left over? Oh, yes, he says about 20 miles from here, there is a place called Dvoretz, which is um, a place where they're building a new airfield. There are about 10,000 Jews there. When I heard this, I said to the boy, come with me. And he said he realized that the boy looked Jewish, meal. He says, you wait a while here. And we went, we said, I said, if you leave the furniture, somebody's going to take it away. You better help us. In the meantime, we start running, and we ran into the, outside the ghetto, into the corn. The corn was so high, and we were so small in size. And we waited in the corn till night, and we started to walk. Then it was very dark. We found a little forest, and the forest, we stayed overnight. I didn't sleep all night. The kid was so tired, he fell asleep. I gave him my jacket to underneath. In the morning when I got up, I woke him up. I didn't sleep so, but he was sleeping. And when we came out from the little woods, he said, I'm not going with you. I said, why aren't you going? He said, uh, my mother and father are dead. I don't want to live anymore. Mm. So I gripped him by his neck. And um, I said, you're not going. Mother threw you out, and she wants you to live like my mother did. Mm. She, he pulled away from me, and he ran. And I says, don't go. Don't go. You ran about 200 feet. And so, and I I was standing and didn't move. He came back to me. Mm. He came back to me. Thank God we were able to go to Dvoritz. As soon as we passed the barbed wire, a cousin of his stood next to the barbed wire. He grabbed a hold of him and kissed him. He says, thank God you are alive. Come with me. I didn't see the boy anymore. Mm. I didn't know he was alive. Uh, you would go on to be reunited with other family members. I want to hear about that uh, right after we take a, a quick break here on Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. My guest today, Rabbi Philip Lazowski, who survived the Holocaust. We're going to hear more about his story, including how he ended up here in Connecticut. And we'll take your calls, too. Do you have a member in your family who survived the Holocaust? Join us, 860-275-7266, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live.
This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today I'm talking with Rabbi Philip Lazowski, a longtime Connecticut resident, uh, faith leader for many years here in the greater Hartford area. He survived the Holocaust after fleeing Nazi-occupied Poland. He hid in the forest uh, when he was 11, and eventually uh, he was reunited with his father and brother. Uh, Coming up later, we're going to hear more about um, his role in helping uh, Connecticut pass a law to teach about the Holocaust in schools. Uh, But Rabbi Lazowski, tell us how you found your father and brother? Well, while we were in Dvoritz, in the ghetto, a Christian friend spotted us that we knew from the town. And he said, oh my God, you're still alive? He says, yes, if you know that my father is alive, tell him that two sons are here in Dvoritz. Because when I went in Dvoritz, I found my brother that he survived. So this Christian friend knew where my father would be hiding in the woods. And he got a hold of him. And my father made sure that he sent two people, because he was too sick himself, to take us out from the ghetto. One of the person took us from the ghetto was my uncle, my mother's brother. That He also survived. So we came into the woods, and we lived in the woods for two and a half years. In order to survive in the woods, you can imagine that there is 50, 60, below zero, the temperature. People freeze to death within half an hour or even less if you don't have proper clothes, which we didn't have. But we had very good Christian friends that the Christian friends worked with my father as fishermen. And they lived not far away, about about five to 10 miles away that we were hiding in these small woods. And we had digged a big hole in the ground for the winter, covered with logs, and were able to survive the winter. The reason is because we prepared some little food. We couldn't get out from the the pit uh, during the regular time, only during a snowstorm or when it, uh, when otherwise the ground you can, that you walk, people would find you. So sometimes we had to wait for two to three weeks in order to survive. How many people were in these holes with you? Was it primarily body heat that helped you stay alive? Body heat. Everything was dark inside, no electricity, no fire. Only the body heat that kept us. If one had to turn, the other one had to turn too. There was not enough room in the pit. The only time we had to go out, the night belonged to us. But the day you couldn't move. The only time we go out outside five, ten minutes in order to be able to to wash your hands or to take a drink from the snow because uh, wait till it melts in order to drink. You lived in the forest there for three years. How did you and your father and brother, how did you make it out of there, Rabbi? Well, 80% did not make it. There, there, there's a there is a story about lice. Ah, oh, this is the worst thing that you can. Lice eats you up alive, and then from the lice you get sick. You get typhus, from the typhus fever. You. Ninety-eight percent of the people without medication, etc., died, and that's why, between eighty-five percent of the people that lived with us did not survive. Only 
Thank God we survived, and I don't know how, but only God's miracle that we survived. And was it a, a cousin that eventually brought you and your father and brother to the United States? No, it's not a cousin. My my father had two sisters and a brother living in the United States before a divorce starts. And they heard that we survived, so they sent us affidavits and they vouched for us that the, the government would not have to support us, etc. And that's why we came to the United States. I was uh, 16 and a half, close to 17 years old. And this happened in 1944 after the area that you were, you were in was liberated. In 1944, we were liberated. If we would wait at another year when the war finished, we wouldn't have been able to survive. Mm. We almost gave up because it was impossible to survive. Mm. After all that you experienced, uh, you had this incredible will to live. Do you, uh, do you think that had to do with your faith or just the, the, the last words your mother had with you, Rabbi? Well, the words of my mother always stuck to me like glue. And I, whatever I did, I always thought about my mother and her words. And then, of course, the will to survive is very important. If there is no will, people just gave up and finished. Mm. But mother's word echoed in my mind, in my heart constantly, that uh, I was trying my very best to, to survive. And survival is one of the most important things um, if you want, if you make, God forbid, one little mistake, you're finished. You went on to, to pursue an education in Brooklyn, and you found yourself at a wedding, and that's when uh, fate brought you to someone in your past. Can you tell us about uh, who you heard about at that wedding? Okay. Usually, when you study, um, you're occupied with your studies, and you don't think about everything else. So while I was studying, a boy, a student in my class, decided to get married. So I invited the whole class. I didn't want to go, but the other boys insisted, listen, go and stop studying for a while. So I went to the wedding. Usually they put in men and women together, and of course people dance. I never danced in my life. So I was sitting like a klutz, you know, uh, without um, anybody. Uh, and then a, a little lady was sitting next to me. So we started a conversation, and uh, she asked me, uh, you go to school? Yes, I go to school. What school? I told him I go to Brooklyn College, and I go to University University. And, uh, and then I asked her, where you come from? And she tells me she comes from a town called Evia, which I knew the region very well. Evia is not far away from the town Belize mm -hmm. that I was born. Oh, I said, you're not far away from my town that I was born, Belize. Oh, she says, you come from Belize? She says, yes, I do. You know, I have a girlfriend that live in Hartford, Connecticut. They told a story they saved a boy from Belize. So I ask her, how did she, they save the boy? She tells me this story. When she finished talking and didn't want to interrupt her, I says, I'm the boy where the people live, in Hartford, Connecticut. So I went right downstairs. I called the operator on the phone and I asked her, can I speak to the Rabinowitz? He says, we have five. Which one do you want? I said, pick the first one. She picked the right one. And the woman answered the phone. And the woman was Miriam Rabinowitz. Rabinowitz. Tell our listeners who that woman was exactly. The same woman you met at the marketplace? The same woman at the marketplace. 
And I told her, I am the boy that you saved. And by the way, I just want to tell you, in the ghetto, I looked in the window in Jettel, and I saw her, and I told my mother, that's the lady who saved my life. She came out and blessed her, and she said, your mother's blessing was so dear to us that we survived. You went on to get to know Miriam's daughter very well, and she became your wife. Right. Ruth Rabinowitz. Ruth Rabinowitz, <laughs> right. And thank God we have three sons, mm -hmm. and we settled here in Hartford, and God was good to me, and, um, and I'm trying to do the best mm -hmm. to help people whatever I can, and, and so are my sons. Mm -hmm. uh, your story is very compelling, and we don't have a lot of time uh, to get into all the details, but I do want to let our listeners know your autobiography is called Faith and Destiny, where they can read more about the details of, of how uh, you would uh, go on uh, to pursue your education as well in Brooklyn. Um, before we head into break, I wanted to ask you, uh, Rabbi, uh, what it means for you uh, to be an American today and your journey. What do you tell people about the fact that you were able to survive when so many people weren't able to? Well, I just want to tell you, I bless this land. This is a wonderful country. And I love living in this country. It's democracy, which I like very much, that everybody has a chance to pursue whatever God gave to him or to her. And uh, we try to help one another to live in peace and in harmony. And that's the most important thing, that people can uh, live in peace and not to be hungry and to help one another. That is the most important uh, message that I, I like to give to people, to help one another mm. and to be kind to one another and to be generous to one another. And that's what the world is all about. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. My guest today is Rabbi Philip Lazowski. He's a Holocaust survivor, Rabbi Emeritus of Beth Hillel Synagogue in Blue Bloomfield and Emmanuel Synagogue in West Hartford, also chaplain to the State Senate. His autobiography, again, is called Faith and Destiny. Now, coming up, uh, Rabbi is going to stay with us as we are joined by a University of Hartford professor who's going to talk about a recent Connecticut law that requires public schools in Connecticut to teach students about the Holocaust. Now, how should teachers discuss this issue, this topic, this very dark moment in our history with young people, you can join our conversation too. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. We've been hearing from Holocaust survivor and Connecticut resident Rabbi Philip Lazowski. Now, what do you remember about how the Holocaust was taught when you were in school? Earlier this year, the New York Times reported, or earlier uh, last year, I should say, the New York Times reported that, quote, many Americans lack basic knowledge about what happened, especially adults between the ages of 18 and 34. So how should the Holocaust and genocide be taught in schools? A Connecticut law went into effect last May that now requires public schools to teach students about the Holocaust and genocide. It turns out our guest, Rabbi Lazowski, had a lot to do uh, with lobbying for that legislation. For more about that law and how uh, teachers are being able uh, to learn more about the ways they should talk about the Holocaust in the classroom, joining us now in studio is Avi Noam Pat. He's professor of modern Jewish history at the University of Hartford, also director Director of the Holocaust Education and Resource Outreach Center. Uh, Avi, welcome to our show. Thank you. So tell us about uh, this bill. What does it require exactly? So uh, I'm so glad that you're doing this show today. Thank you so much. And thank you to Rabbi Lazowski. Uh, the, the bill itself, which, uh, as, as you mentioned, Rabbi Lazowski and his son, Alan, were quite instrumental in, in working on for many years. We became the 10th state in the country to require Holocaust and genocide education. 
basically requires that it be taught as part of social studies curricula uh, in high school or middle schools. Uh, it doesn't provide much guidance in terms of how it should be taught, which means that uh, it's up to uh, organizations, uh, community organizations, groups like Voices of Hope, which is a very important organization of children and grandchildren of Holocaust survivors, uh, institutions of higher education like the University of Hartford, University of Connecticut, the Hero Center, which we've just created, to provide resources, guidance, instruction for how to teach the Holocaust and other genocides. So uh, fortunately, we do have many resources available, and we've developed curricula, which we share with teachers. We do annual workshops for teachers, which take place all over the state, uh, to provide those resources for how to teach what is a very important, but also very difficult subject to teach. Uh, when that survey uh, came out uh, last year and, and the Times reported that many Americans don't know a lot about uh, the Holocaust, did that surprise you, Avi? Frankly, it, it doesn't surprise me. Um, I think uh, this is actually part of sort of a more general lack of, of appreciation for history. Uh, if, if the questions themselves ask people what they know about historical events in general, we'll find that most people don't know much about uh, historical events. And so it doesn't surprise me necessarily. Uh, it, it does uh, sadden me and disappoint me. And obviously, this is something that, uh, you know, I've taken uh, the, the lessons that uh, Rabbi Lazowski and other Holocaust survivors have taught and taken them to heart. And this is a subject that I've dedicated my career to, to teaching about. And I obviously think that it's incredibly important that if we want to build a better world in the future, we have to learn from the lessons of the past. Uh, but it means that there is work that remains to be done. So what are the challenges uh, to teaching about the Holocaust? And again, the lessons we can learn um, from uh, this, uh, this history uh, in the classroom. What are you hearing from teachers as you're trying to give them resources uh, to then uh, carry on uh, this lesson to their students? Sure. So uh, you know, for a lot of teachers, one of the one of the most difficult challenges is where to begin. Um, and I don't mean do we begin in 1933 or 1939. What I mean is that they have a very limited amount of time. They have a great number of things that they're required to teach. And depending on the school, they may have a day, a week, a month, a semester to teach it. And so one of the of the resources that we're provi trying to provide with for teachers is how to do this even in a limited amount of time. What are the most important lessons to be taught uh, from this historical event? And I should mention that uh, you know the legislation is for Holocaust and genocide, which means that uh, teachers can can teach about the Holocaust, but they can also teach about, unfortunately, the the history of the 20th century is a history of horrible genocide. And in fact, one of the elements that comes out as we study the Holocaust and we learn about this crime of genocide is that in our history we have many examples of genocides that have taken place. Uh, even here in the state of Connecticut that, that we can teach about. So teachers have the opportunity. They can teach about the Pequot War. They can teach about the Armenian Genocide. They can teach about the genocide in Rwanda. They can teach about Bosnia. So um, the Holocaust is, is one element which uh, we hope teachers will teach. But the most important thing is that uh, they teach about uh, the, the the horrible things that have happened in history and that we hope that students can learn from man's inhumanity to man, but also that they have an opportunity to do things like uh, Mrs. Rabinowitz in the marketplace or like mm -hmm. those people, those uh, Christian neighbors who helped Rabbi Lazowski and his family, that everyone can make a difference, that the individual choices make a difference, that students can learn that if they do one thing to help another person, if they speak out when they see uh, inhumanity, they speak out when they see hate speech, they say, that's not right, that's something that I have to object to, that it can make a difference in someone else's life. Mm -hmm. Uh, Rabbi Lazowski, uh, so again, uh, this law was passed and signed into law uh, last May. This is the first full school year where teachers are able to, uh, you know, use the lessons from University of Hartford and Avi's work uh, to teach their students. But what about the relevance of the, these lessons today? We hear that hate crimes are on the rise, uh, anti-Semitism, uh, if you look let's look recently at what happened in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about um, your uh, feelings when you hear about these incidents that are still happening? Well, I would like to quote uh, Pope Francis. His remark was that a good Christian cannot be an anti-Semite. 
and uh, we as Jews have suffered terribly during the thousands of years of to be um, under the yoke of anti-Semitism. So I myself feel that any Christian would be a good Christian, there would be no anti-Semitism. Unfortunately, uh, some people go to church and they learn things but they don't obey. Mm. And I feel if they would learn the good book, they would not kill, they would not hate one another. Hate is the worst thing that we have for people. From hate becomes a, a tragedy that that keep on hating and hating with no reason, and that brings some unfortunate life to others. Uh, Avi, when we think about uh, act, you know, events that happen uh, not only in Connecticut but nationwide, um, how do you counsel teachers to bring in uh, what they're hearing in the news uh, to uh, these lesson plans? Is it possible? Sure. You know, one of one of the things that we have to understand is, you know, as you mentioned, we see we're living in an environment where we see increasing levels of anti-Semitism. And, and usually anti-Semitism is, is just the tip of the iceberg, that is, that is sort of the leading edge of a, a greater wave of sort of larger elements of hate. So we have anti-Semitism, we have rising levels of racism, we have xenophobia, we have all sorts of forms of discrimination, and this is just part of, of a larger wave. And so one of the things that, that we try to encourage teachers to focus on when they teach about this is that you know, Rabbi mentioned that the the difficulties of confronting hate, and I always think about uh, this quote from uh, the noted Holocaust survivor Elie Wiesel, where he says, "You know, the opposite of of love is not necessarily hate. The opposite of love is indifference." And so, one of the things that we hope to teach students is that they can't be indifferent to the suffering of others. That uh, when when another is persecuted, when another is discriminated against, that it's their responsibility to speak up on their behalf, to care, to develop uh, empathy, to understand what it is like to be in the shoes of another, and to speak out uh, against that type of persecution of the other. Um, when one person is othered, we all suffer, and we have a responsibility to understand the experience of the other and and speak out in their in their defense. Um, we only have a, a, a under about a couple of minutes left, and uh, we know that there aren't very many uh, Holocaust survivors uh, that remain with us today. Uh, mm-hmm. First-hand accounts are very powerful. They can stay with us. Um, what are some initiatives that are happening, uh, just in, briefly, that will carry on these stories, Avi? Oh, so Lucy, this is something that I've spent a lot of time trying to figure out what we're going to do Um you know, as as educators, we're so blessed to have people like uh, Rabbi Lazowski, Ruth Lazowski, other Holocaust survivors at, at our a museum at the University of Hartford. We have an exhibit called Hartford Remembers the Holocaust, where we tell the stories of six local Holocaust survivors. Uh, and through video testimony and it's interactive, students can meet survivors, but they can also view the videos and learn from them. Um, groups like Voices of Hope have, have tried very hard to also engage the children and grandchildren of survivors for them to learn their parents' stories, to be able to tell their stories and answer questions from students as well. The Shoah Foundation, which Steven Spielberg started, has embarked on what is really an incredible new initiative to use artificial intelligence so that you can view a, a survivor testimony, ask the computer a question, and the survivor will answer back to you. So there are all sorts of things, but one of the, the difficulties of, of all of this is understanding what we will do when there are no survivors left, and, and this will be a great challenge. Uh, we're going to link to uh, your program at University of Hartford so our listeners can learn more about the work you're doing. Again, Avi Pat, Professor of Modern Jewish History at University of Hartford, thank you for coming in today. Thank you. Also, to Rabbi by Philip Lazowski. A pleasure to hear from you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> Today's show produced by Carmen Baskoff. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. As always, thanks for listening.